the whole point of today's conversation is to get beyond the statistics and stop talking about these kind of you know dry things and get a little personal. So um, that said, I'm going to open with the statistic. Women make 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. And I want to step away from the whole systemic, you know, we're trying to play catch up because we've only been in the workforce the last you know, few decades. And I want to get to um, women's seeming reluctance to actually talk about money. I'm from the South and you don't talk about age, you don't talk about uh, weight, and you don't talk about money. So did anybody teach you guys how to negotiate, how to you know, financially take care of yourself? Jamie, did you? Uh, yeah, I think I was lucky um, in that my mother worked. She was an executive when I was growing up, and she uh, took it upon herself to make sure that I had a good sense of financial acumen, that I was, uh, I got a bank account nice and early and she taught me how to balance my checkbook. Um, and I, and just having that female role model in the house that was a dominant breadwinner, mm-hmm. I think uh, made a big difference. And I have two daughters now and I, they both have bank accounts already and we talk about budgets. And so I think, I think that made a big difference for me. That's great. So you grew up managing your own money. Yeah. Mm. What about you, Bridget? I, I guess the same story. My mom worked full time. My dad was an actor, and as they said in the old days, a starving actor. So my mom was kind of the primary breadwinner, right? So um, she definitely showed us the example, and um, I kind of took that into my own career. I was the prim- was am the primary breadwinner most of my career. So when you are in that position, I think you take that a little bit more seriously. Um, Although I was not really good at asking for money until maybe in the last 10 years or so. Um, But you do, I think you have a little bit more confidence in in that when you are the one, you know. Not that it should warrant if you're not the one, you shouldn't equally be paid. But in my situation, yeah. Amber, were you ever taught to negotiate, to sit down and you know, kind of hammer out a, a salary or you know, figure out what you're worth and talk to other women, especially in the industry, and see what everyone's making? And, no. No? <laughs> I don't think so. Do you learn on the fly? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Well, um, I want to talk about systemic bias for a minute. So we've gotten past this phenomenon of, um, you know, the pinching a rear or, you know, calling you honey or sending you to get coffee. For the most part, I feel like we're, we've kind of evolved past that. And what we're actually dealing with now is a more kind of ingrained, um, nuanced, subtle type of bias. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about how you approach that. When a boss tells you you look nice, how do you know, you know if that's a compliment or if it's suggestive? And even more, how do you go and talk to somebody else about that? Because you can't convey tone, you can't convey body language. Have you guys ever encountered something like this and how did you handle it? Jamie? Um, that's, that's a tough one. I think, I think intuition plays a lot into it. Um, like I certainly don't hesitate giving compliments to my male colleagues when they have a fresh haircut or a new suit. Right. And it's never been misconstrued as anything more than a compliment. I think there's there's a way that they need to be delivered. There's certainly a professionalism that comes with it. it saying you have a nice outfit is much different from something much more suggestive. So I think there's a balance there. Um, where I've experienced um, people crossing a line that I wasn't comfortable with. Um, I, I've used humor to manage it in this situation and try to diffuse it with humor, but still get my point across. Um, but I would say it happens, the, maybe the older I've gotten or the more senior I've gotten, the, the less often that line gets crossed and where I see it get crossed with with younger women or people that I mentor then I'll be the one to call it out 
so Amber, what about you? When you encounter things like this, do you do the same, you know, what we call it de-escalation yeah. tactics, you know, where you laugh it off or, you know, try to try to keep it from blowing up into yeah, something bigger? I think so. And there's been times where I've had to say, you know, like call it out directly um, and say this is not, you know, how you talk to people or how you want to be spoken to. So sometimes, I mean, I think that the person may be unaware because it's that built-in bias. And you do have to tell them. And what's the reaction when you tell them that? I Generally, it stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my experience. Bridget, what about you? Have you uh, run into this? Sure. I mean, I think it's, you know, especially I've been in the workforce probably longer than you two. But, um, you know... So, and as, I think it actually works both ways. I have seen women speak totally inappropriately in situations sure. with men, and I've seen men speak, you know, in, inappropriately with women. And again, the older I've gotten, the more confident I'm on that just says, hey, you know, that's just not appropriate. Let's yeah. change the subject, let's go somewhere else, take that outside, <laughs> whatever it is you're gonna do. Um, but I can see how if somebody is not that confident and they're in that situation, it's a sense. You either know someone's coming on to you or you don't, or, or you know, very few people are completely blindsided. Like, oh, I never saw that coming, right? So I think you have to be aware. I think that's something we probably didn't have to be before. Now you have to be aware. And then I think you have to just have the confidence to say, hey, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't, you know, could we you know, not have that conversation or let, let's talk about something else. Um, but that's a scary thing to do, especially when you're young. Yes. Because you think that person in power has control over you in some way. And that's really the only situation, not only, but I think that's the biggest situation in which this is trouble. Yeah. Is when someone of power over you or your career is actually speaking to you or says things in a way that makes you uncomfortable. And I think you do have to be... Yeah, I uh, I mentor a lot of young women. It's kind of a passion project of mine, and uh, that's one of the conversations I always have with them when they're you know young and starting out. Is be prepared for when this situation happens. Just get ahead of it, kind of visualize it, get ready for it, think about what your reaction will be, so that when it does happen, because inevitably you will be in a situation where you're going to have to deal with it. So don't let it surprise you. Go through the motions of preparing for it well in advance and and also make sure that when you're in uh, situations that might be work situations but it's after hours there's alcohol involved make sure you really understand your surroundings how you're going to handle that have a buddy system like just kind of going through the motions of preparation I think um, can certainly do them a lot of good as they do you have a similar conversation with your male direct reports? Uh, these are mentees, not direct reports, and oh, I wouldn't. Okay. I'm sorry. I wouldn't have that conversation with a direct report. Do you no. mentor any men? I I don't mentor many young men now. No. And the reason I've chosen to to focus on younger women is uh, is really because there are so few female executives in tech in Canada, um, and we have such a challenge keeping young women engaged in the field. And part of it is is a lack of role models, a lack of people they can identify with, they can have conversations about um, work-life balance, different issues that they couldn't have with a man. So just given the scarcity um, that exists of people in a position like mine to, to have those conversations with young women, I, I've made a conscious effort to make myself available more to the younger women. Not that, that I wouldn't love to mentor the young men as well, but right. they can have a conversation that with the male mentors that, that sure, sure. women just can't. Amber, what about this conversation? I mean, I'm, I'm struck listening to Jamie talk that, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little bit resentful that I have to have this conversation and men don't. And I, I think that uh, a good bit of that comes from the fact that it's not just within the workplace. I have to be aware of that from the time I wake up until the time I go to sleep. Um, how do you how do you approach this? You know, whenever you're, you're talking to you know someone younger, or whenever you're going into a you know situation where you think maybe maybe it might be an issue. Um, I think what you mentioned to be prepared. So you because a lot of it's mental. So if you've got the mental mindset ahead of time, I think that can help a lot. Um, and I also think that sometimes you have to realize. 
things aren't going to change. I've had situations where I think we didn't end up working with a client because of that, and in that case, you, you can't change that person. Yeah. They're, you know, they're in their mindset, and it's not going to be a good fit if they're not going to want to have that relationship or respect for you, and sometimes it's just not, it's not going to work. You know, I've heard that from a lot of uh, women who work for MSPs in this space that I've spoken with. Um, and if, I want to go back to something, Bridget, that you talked about a minute ago, um, about how scary it is, especially for young women, or for women who are in a position to trying to, you know, get the business or get the promotion or, you know, something like that. How scary it is not just to speak up, but to tell someone who is in a position to help. How do you go to an HR manager and say, he told me I look nice today, or, you know, something like that? Um, what kind of advice would you give young women to, you know, be able to kind of handle this if they're not equipped to directly confront the person who's, who's insulting them? Well, um, so I just, I think the recent movement and all of the visibility is, is certainly helping, right? So as I put it, a lot of big trees have fallen in the forest, mm-hmm. right? Like and and we heard them. We have, yeah. and all of us have heard them. And you know, had that been only the president of Chevron or only the president of a you know an MSP, we wouldn't have heard those trees. But we heard big giant trees fall across major industries, and. I encourage women to use that as part of their confidence going forward, right? They, they need to see that and know that that gives them permission to say, uh, that's enough. Or, you know what, I'd like to sit down and talk about my compensation, right? Or, you know, I'd like to sit down and talk about a new job. Um, not every tree has to fall in the forest before we take responsibility for movement. And I, and I, I have 14 nieces and I have Four I'm sons, silent. fourteen nieces. You have fourteen yes. nieces. Yes, and uh, in my immediate family, I have four boys and a girl, and my boys totally get it. You know, and maybe it's because they grew up with really strong women in their lives, mm. right? Um, they have very strong wives. They totally respect their wives, and it's a partnership. So I think there is this portion um, in this next generation. First of all, I think they were raised in a way much different than ours, right. that they do feel empowered. And I think that this whole recent last year or so visibility is giving those people confidence. Now, to your question about what about the ones who can't, um, you know, they, they need to reach out to someone because they can't do it within themselves. They definitely have to reach out to someone and find a safe harbor right. that they can talk to. And I, I think that's kind of what you were yeah, saying exactly. is that they may not have that in their workforce because they work with all men. Right. Um, but I would be surprised. There are some sympathetic men who have wives and little girls that would probably be safe harbor. Yeah. And to, to your point about um, kind of the movement giving people the confidence to speak right. up, there was an article, I'm from Canada, there was an article in the paper this week uh, that the Canadian Forces has seen a doubling, so a 200% increase in reported sexual assault over the past year. And that's not because there's a du- been a doubling of assaults, it's, right. it's women being more confident coming forward, and that's a good thing. It is a good thing. It's a great thing. And hopefully it'll build, you know, gain momentum. Over Absolutely. Time. It's already has. Yeah. So you, you, you raise a really good point. You talk about the Me Too movement um, and people, you know, bringing this out of the realm of unconscious bias. We can no longer call it unconscious bias. Everyone in the country is talking about it. Right. Um, so maybe that'll, you know, help give voice to, to some women. Who and it still happens. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the high tech industry, manufacturing world. It's, it's still a lot of, you know, older, you know, Caucasian men that are dominant in those, um, you know, customer facing type of roles. So um, it's not gone by any imagination, but all those guys, most of them have daughters. And so it's really clicked. It really has. Let me ask you a question. I apologize. I didn't prepare you for this, but... Um, <laughs> I, when you mentioned that, I'm curious. So you're right. In this space, it is you know predominantly uh, white men. Do you find that being a female has helped or hurt your career in any way? Well, for me, it um, I launched my own company because of it. Um, I was working as an IT director and applying for jobs, and I was told things like. Um, 
we've never considered a woman or because my kids were younger at that time so they were getting sick a lot so I would ask about being able to take time off and they said what do you mean you want to work part time you don't want to work and I was like I have to start my own company <laughs> so but because of that that was a huge motivation for me to go ahead and start my own business and create the environment that would be conducive. we have 50% women in our company unlimited time off from day one everybody works from home and flexible schedules so that people don't have to make the kind of choices that I went through and they you know if my kids get sick or they can stay at home with me um, and I think for me that's what inspired that it was a huge part of it I think that's fabulous and we're gonna definitely touch on the whole motherhood penalty issue here in a minute um, but I am curious from our other two panelists have you noticed any impact in your career from being you know a unicorn in this space it's a double-edged sword. I think early in your in my career, I came up on the sales side, and, and being a woman um, had opened some doors more easily in some situations. Uh, it also made it more difficult in a number of other situations. In the way, and once when I was focused on an executive career path, I had to navigate in a way that my male colleagues didn't. Right. So, but it. It's not all harder. You, there are right. some doors that open more easily for you, but um, just as many are harder to get through, if not more. Yeah, yeah I, I would say definitely while I was, when I was young and I was having my children, um, there were jobs that were not available to me because I was working full time, but I also was the mom and I had to be the mom and I had to run the household, right? So definitely, I, I my career definitely stalled in that time frame. But I will tell you that once my kids got older and um, were off to college, uh, my career has done nothing but take off. Mm -hmm. Because there are companies that want strong female leaders in their ranks. They, they get the fact it differentiates them. Um, they get the fact that they need that diversity at the, at the table. Um, and so from my experience, you know, the last 15 years has been fantastic for me. Um, but I definitely miss job opportunities and that slowed me down. But I went back to work right after I had my kids. I didn't take long times off. One job, my daughter, I was off for five weeks. And I, I was like, I need to get back to work. I need to get back to work. I don't want to lose my position. Yeah. You know, so there was a big price to pay. Right. But it, it paid off in the long run if you're playing the long game uh, for me. I want to piggyback off of something that you said a few minutes ago um, when we were talking about sexual harassment. And you said, I've seen it go both ways. I've definitely seen you know women be inappropriate to men. And on this topic, it occurs to me, this also goes both ways. Um, you know, when we're talking about this kind of insidious systemic bias and this, this, you know, traditional gender roles that are just embedded into the way that we live Absolutely and right. the traditions that we learn. Um, what is your take on the whole, you know, let's switch it the other way around. There's women that are uh, feel like they're forced to go back into the workforce, you know, too soon and there are men out there who want to be able to stay at home and they really they have a hard time I think in, in Canada we we have parental leave policies and you're seeing more and more men take advantage of that I have a number of girlfriends that are primary breadwinners and the husband stays at home so I think I mean, it's not the norm by any means, but you're seeing a more generalized acceptance of it, and it's it's less rare. I suspect we'll see that continue. I mean, parents, dads want to be able to be home with their kids too. I, I think this next generation yeah. is just as is more interested even in being active parents and being active participants, and they don't want to be the ones responsible for working all day and not right. not getting that relationship with their children. So I, I'm optimistic for both sides. 
what about you, Amber? You talked about having a business that's really focused on empowering working mothers um, and family time. Have you seen this phenomenon work both ways? Yeah, I think I think it's. I mean, I live in Chicago, so um, you know, much more urban area. And I again, like you said, it's very common now. You know, a lot of times, you uh, know, meet people who the, the husband is helping equally or, or more than equally with childcare. My husband's a teacher, so he has the kids all summer actually while I do home work. Um, so in our, you know, for us too, it's been kind of reverse. And you know, we want it as our company too. We want to also. That's why we built the policies the way we did, so that it applies to both. It's not biased towards women or men either way. It applies to any parental leave or any time off like that. Yeah. Um, I remember talking to to a male um, MSP owner um, and him talking about how when he worked for the big vendor, it felt so awkward for him to be the one to ask for time off to go, you know, pick up the sick child or, you know, get off early to go to the science fair. Um, it, it's not that people were judging him harshly, but it was just a conversation that was awkward, awkward to yeah. still have. Yeah. So when we're talking about these kind of traditional gender roles, um, Jamie, you were speaking earlier about um, how young women really have to be careful about going out and, you know, having a drink at the bar with the boys, or, you know, there are a lot of business deals that get done over drinks at the bar. Um, you know, there are these these type of, of situations um, that a lot of women are trying to figure out how to, you know, overcome, and we've come a long way in the channel, but I mean, let's let's be honest. It wasn't that long ago that we had booth babes at all the conferences, yep. and uh, you know there were still deals being done in gentlemen's clubs, to put it nicely. Um, so, how would you encourage, um, especially a young woman who might not have that confidence we were talking about earlier? How would you encourage them to try to create a situation in which it is an even playing field? You know, if someone says, hey, you know, let's go grab a drink after work, and she knows she's not going to be able to drink or have more than one, you know, um, how, how can she turn that situation? You know, how can she uh, try to make that playing field a little more even? It's hard. I... I encourage women to have their own network. So part of that advantage that guys have is it's easier for them to create a net, an informal network where they support each other. Um, and Canada's big on hockey. Most companies have corporate hockey leagues, and the guys have that as a right. as an informal network. Um, and my my coaching is it's really hard to be part of that network for a lot of women, but it's important that you have a network. So. There are a tons of industry associations and ways that women can build networks of their own to get that to get that support and that that system built around them. Um, and and really, that's my advice. You're not always going to be at the table with the boys, but make sure you've got a table of your own to be at. What about building some sort of network like that within an organization? Um, I mean, it's it's great. I fully I fully agree with you that women should take advantage of all these associations and organizations. And we're talking about you know you've got uh, a male and a female at the same level, and then you know they're competing for the promotion internally. You know how do you how do you try again? How do you try to even that playing field? Um, the sports is a great example. Um, I spoke with a woman uh, earlier earlier in the year who talked about the all-male executive retreat. They go hunting every year, um, and she's not invited to go. Um, yeah. So how how do you how do you walk that line between standing up and saying I, I don't think so, and a risk offending the very person that you're trying to impress? Yeah, that's yeah. a tough question. Um, it's situational. So in the example you just gave, which looks, I'll use that one, where a company is still somehow having men's off-sites, that's crazy talk. I mean, I don't know what state that happens in, but I'm in Silicon Valley, and it does not have, I mean, that that's not, men's off-sites in Silicon Valley are not happening. Um, if they are, they're, they're, I don't want to say not happening, but... They're not prevalent, and they're certainly disappearing because there are more women in the industry. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think it's situational. That that one is, I think, some uh, one that might be a little, you know, dramatic. But just even going to the hockey games, I mean, some women don't like hockey. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to go to hockey. And guess what? They're working full time, and they and when their husbands are staying home, they want to go see the kids. Right. So they don't want to go out and sit at a hockey game. They don't have any, you know, interest in right. I think that you were about to say something a moment ago when we were, when we were talking about how to walk that line. I was just going to say, I think um, part of it is recognizing that that's not maybe a good fit for you professionally, because right. if you're in an environment Let's like that, you may not be able to change it, and it's better to just go somewhere that's a better fit. I think a lot of it's recognizing the limits, um, and that can be for a lot of different things other than even gender, but I think, I, I, to me, I've spent some time in a position where I felt like I was banging my head against the wall and you know you kind of realize at some point that that's just a waste of time and you need to go somewhere that you can do you know better better yourself and just get ahead where people where people get it yeah, yeah. Um, so it, when we were talking a moment ago about organizations and associations what are some of the key things that women need to get out of these associations? There's a million of them. And, I mean, even just here in the channel, and then you look at the wider world of tech and then the wider world of business, there are so many. Uh, what should women look for in these peer organizations, and what should they look to get out of it? When should they when should they say, this one's not for me, and you know, try something else, or you know, look to ask people for certain things? And like anything, it's fit. You're looking to expand your network. You're looking to get um, people you can bounce different ideas off for different points in time in, in your career. Um, you know, you might, if you're in an all-male environment and something happens, they you want to have somebody that you can call and say, this just happened. What do you think? What should I do? That's, that's also in the professional world. You want a network that uh, gives you insight to what's going on in the industry, gives you different perspectives. There's all different things that, that, um, that your network should be able to give you, but it, ultimately it's, it's about fit and building relationships with other human beings. Bridget, do you have any experience in this? You know, being able to tell people you should you should learn how to negotiate for a salary, for example, or you know, build your network, as you were just saying. Um, are these some of the, the key traits that women should learn, and is this a good environment in which to learn them? Yeah, so let, uh, networking is such an interesting term um, for me. So men do this naturally, and then we have to somehow figure out how to do it. You know what I mean? It's like, they have their network, they know how to do that whole thing, and then we're like, okay, you need to learn how to network. I don't know how to do that. What is that? And then we, we again, we, we score differently, right? When we meet someone, we actually think we need to give them something in order to get something. And and quite frankly, in a, in a male, you know, network, I'll use the word generically, that isn't how it is. They don't, they don't ever go in thinking, they may come in thinking, I want something, but they are not coming in thinking I got to give you something first. Right, right. So that's a psyche thing, and that's a I think that's a female thing that, in order to build your network, you have to move on. I I was looking for a job about fifteen, uh, about ten years ago or so, and um, I realized that my entire network was in my company, and I didn't have a network outside my company. So I started. You know, reaching out. I got involved with some associations. LinkedIn is the best tool on earth, by the way. Um, if you can't build a network with LinkedIn, then you're not, you know, not, you need to learn how to use net, net LinkedIn to build your network overall. So, um, so anyway, that's kind of yeah. thing about it. Amber, do you belong to any of these associations or organizations? I do. I'm a, um, I'm a PMP, so I'm very involved in the project management world, and okay. I'm on the executive council, and I do the mentoring through there. Um, I was doing a little bit with Sam, but it was, again, it was all golf outings, and it was all at <laughs> night. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't something I was interested in. Um, yeah, those are the ones I'm mostly involved with, is through the project management side. But I think, yeah, that's a great idea to have that outside network. So, did you just say that you're a mentor to women in these? Um, yes, yes, the uh, Project Management Institute. 
so what is it that you, like, what is the first thing that you make sure that you talk about um, whenever you know you, you develop this relationship? How do you start that off? Well, the the program I do is a formal mentoring program where you actually have um, you have to write statements about what you want to accomplish your goals. Um, so I mean, again, a lot of that is more about becoming project manager and advancing that profession. But um, I've worked with women who have been the mentees I've had, and uh, I think it's you know about knowing your goals and then also knowing how achievable those goals are. Like I said earlier, some environments you're not going to be able to achieve those goals. Sometimes your mentoring is focused on helping them figure out what their goals are. Yeah. And that alone is value. Yeah, I mean, I've had lots of people and they want, oh, I want you to be my mentor. Okay, sit down. So what do you, you know, what are your goals? Where do you see yourself in? Yeah. I never do the 10-year thing, but like, where do you see yourself in three years? Okay, maybe five is even pretty far out. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I said, well, if you don't know where you're going, I mean, if you don't know where you want to be, how, how do you know how you're going to get there? And sometimes the goal is, I want to have kids in the next year or two. How is that going to affect my career? What do I do? Um, that can be something that you have to try to figure out. Yeah, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. So we have just a few minutes left, um, and I want to make sure that we leave our audience with some takeaways that you know they can actually implement. Um, so uh, let's hear it. Your one piece of advice for business owners in the channel that if they come away with the session, here's the one thing they need to know and the one thing they should try to do in their businesses tomorrow. Well, I mean, like I said, we have 50% women in our company, and I think that gives us a huge advantage. I personally find women to be amazing IT employees, um, and I would say hire more women. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> Jamie? Uh, I think the tone comes from the top. So the CEOs and the leadership team needs to be aware of the diversity of their organizations. They need to be aware, aware of the culture, the tone that they're setting. Um, and you know, take an honest look at, at who they are and who they want to be with respect to um, the makeup of the workforce and the culture that, that exists there. Lead by example. Tone from the top. Bridget? So mine would be for women. I'll use one that looks from the woman up. And so okay. I think I totally agree with you. They, they have to understand the competitive advantages yeah. it delivers to them, and then they need to make it happen. My advice to women is be brave. Okay, what's and I tell this to my nieces. What is the worst thing they're going to say to you? When you ask for the raise, when you ask for the promotion, when you ask for the time off. And if you can deal with the worst thing that they can, then get in there and ask. Yeah. So my advice is be brave. There's there, there's not anything you can't ask for. All three very great answers. <laughs> Ladies, I am uh, so grateful that you joined me today for this talk. Uh, I hope that our audience enjoyed it as well. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Thank you. you.